It's uh, 2.30 p.m. here in Singapore. Uh, we're live at DBS Asia Central. A warm welcome to our monthly live stream. Uh, this is the third time that we have done it this year so far. It's going well. Thanks to those of you who have listened to, to us before and welcome to those who are listening for the first time. We have a lot to cover, so I'm going to get right into it. We are going to go over five major themes and we've got five DBS analysts to go over each of them. And then we've received uh, half a dozen or so questions from you guys already. Uh, we will go over them once these five uh, components are covered. So the first component is on my side. Uh, I will be basically talking about the issue of the day. Um, and we, of course, have a rather uh, alarming uh, uh, title of that, which is a Ch China US decoupling scenario. So uh, I'm assuming the listeners to this call have a fairly good idea about the latest developments. I'm not going to rehash that. Uh, but the big deadline now is, of course, uh, 17th of June, when the US would um, uh, likely uh, raise a tariff on $300 billion worth of uh, remaining uh, trade uh, that the Chinese do with the US, uh, and the tariff will be levied at 25%. Uh, there is a listening and review period that is ongoing. There'll be companies that would lobby. Uh, I would assume Apple would lobby hard to keep uh, iPhones out of this tariff um, uh, wall, but uh, our baseline view is that uh, we really don't see anything that is happening in the next three weeks that's going to change it. Um, so this scenario that I have on the screen right now, we actually worked on this scenario almost a year ago. And at that time, this was an absolutely tail risk scenario. We didn't think it in the realms of possibility. And now we're just a few weeks away uh, from that. Uh, so let's hope that center heads would prevail. Let's hope that we may go to the brink and, and uh, step back. Or let's also hope that maybe the tariffs do get put in place, but in a month or a few weeks later, uh, negotiations take a turn for the positive side and they're taken away. But the possibility that they are raised to 25% on June 17 and they remain in place for the rest of the year is not a tail risk scenario anymore. And hence, uh, what we have here is that if trade negotiations go absolutely nowhere and we have 25% tariff on all exports out of China to the US and US exports to the Chinese also get hit with commensurate amount of tariff, then uh, what will happen to the world? Well, it would be seismic. Uh, it would be seismic because it would have a very negative impact on the global investment cycle, which isn't that great to begin with, and it undermine it substantially because there would be massive amounts of uncertainty. I'll, I'll give you a sense of that uncertainty from this morning's headline. In the last year or so, one issue has been that you know there will be trade diversification. If the U.S. is putting all sorts of restriction on Chinese exports, uh, exports will uh, trade will move out of China and go to the likes of Vietnam, Thailand, or Mexico. And Mexico being right next to the U.S. and being part of the free trade zone between the U.S. and Canada and Mexico makes all the sense in the world. And now look at Trump's tweet from this morning. If indeed we're going to have 5% tariff on Mexican exports to the U.S. a month from now, and then it goes to 10 and then it goes to 15, by October, that also becomes 25. Imagine the uh, loss of attractiveness of Mexico. And then anybody who had been sort of being smart and trying to orient some of their production to Mexico now will feel that they've been completely had. So that's the point, that it will have a very debilitating impact on global investment sentiments, and it will have, by extension, impact, negative impact on global consumption. So if consumption and investments both take a hit, we will expect about 125% downside to China's current GDP trajectory of six and a quarter, and 2020 growth could slow all the way down to five. U.S. growth would be hit even further, given how late cycle the economy is in right now, and we have seen signs of uh, how, uh, overhang on the inventory side, uh, we could see that as a major source of downward uh, uh, drag for 2020. So an investment slowdown led growth weakness, uh, about 1% growth next year, which could also mean there'll be a couple of quarters of 0% growth. And again, not a baseline scenario, but it is important for us to consider what was really unthinkable six months ago, but it is becoming more and more real. Uh, and uh, Philip, we will talk about exchange risk a lot. I'll just quickly go over the fact that we do see substantial additional downside to the RMB, perhaps another 15% against the US dollar in this uh, full-on trade war scenario. And that would, of course, come on the back of soaring uh, dollar, uh, as we saw in the case of 2008-2009, global financial crisis. Even if the crisis is affecting the US, the global risk aversion and flight to safety materializes in US fixed income uh, receiving huge amount of flows and US currency appreciating. Uh, 
And of course, this would be a major demand shock for the whole world, a negative shock, and therefore oil would correct substantially. In fact, we have seen that play out in the last couple of weeks already. Our baseline scenario of the Fed doing nothing for the next year or so will then be revised into 50 to 75 base, basis point uh, rate cut by the Fed. Now, mind you, there is one wrinkle here, which is that what if we see the lingering impact of tight U.S. job market and strong wage growth coupled with tariff-related pass-through into consumer prices, creating a stagflation-like scenario for the U.S.? Well, that would be a very, very challenging scenario and, of course, would make the life of U.S. Federal Reserve particularly complicated. But my personal view is that these tariffs are basically affecting durable goods. They're not affecting non-durable goods. They're not affecting services. And durable goods actually don't make up a very large part of U.S. CPI. So even in a 25% tariff scenario, the likelihood for a big up, uh, upside to inflation, in my view, is not, not substantial. Uh, typically, what will happen in the case of this tariff escalation is that some of the upside would be uh, eaten by the Chinese suppliers, some of it would be eaten by the U.S. producers, and some of it would be passed through to the consumer. Uh, so there will be a bit of a burden sharing, if you will, uh, and by the time it sort of translates into overall CPI, the impact would not be that much. This, however, will have a major negative impact on overall global growth dynamic. Between China and the U.S., we have basically 40% of global growth, and hence global growth will weaken substantially, basically to the lowest level since we saw in 2008-2009. Um, the various unintended consequences of this um, spat is, is visible in various metrics. One of them would be the one that I have on the screen right now. We now have U.S. soybean stockpiles basically at a record high level. So despite all these expectations that the Chinese would start buying substantial quantities of U.S. soybean even before uh, the uh, trade deal takes place, or that some U.S. soybean would sort of divert through Argentina or elsewhere and make their way to China, well, it turns out that it doesn't work that easily. Basically, what happens is you just don't sell a lot of your product, and that's why we see now record high inventory in soybean in the U.S. This data, by the way, is all the way through April of this year. Um, the uh, other issue is a uh, global electronic cycle. Mind you, uh, long before the trade war problems kicked in, we had a secular turn downturn in global uh, electronic cycle. The demand for smartphones, the way they had grown through, let's say, 2007, 2015, was reaching some sort of a maturation point. Uh, I think most of you who have phones don't have that desire to change your phones every single year because new features are not that um, uh, you know, massive in terms of incremental uh, value addition. Um, and hence, uh, and, and also uh, both in the cloud servers and computing space, there's been a huge amount of capital investment. So there was a secular slowdown in global electronic cycle in any case. That was felt even before the trade war started, but now it's actually getting compounded because of trade wars. So that's the issue that if indeed we're going to have a decoupling scenario where the U.S. will put up such strong barriers for the Chinese that the world will basically come to the conclusion you're going to have two specs. Things will be made for the Chinese market or China will make certain things for the rest of the world, but not for the U.S. And then you'll have another set of specs for U.S. Now, this in the long term could mean there'll be pickup in global investment, um, multiple cha uh, production chains, uh, supply chains, and so on. But that would be down the road. And also down the road, that would also mean more inflationary impact, more cyclical fluctuation, and less economies of scale, because China being the largest producer of the world will not be part of that. Um, but on the uh, downside, the near-term impact would be actually quite negative, because there would be excess capacity in China, uh, there would be a lag in setting up new production processes, and therefore we will see gaps in uh, various uh, product cycles. Uh, and I think the most immediate danger of that is the global 5G rollout. It may get delayed, it may get postponed. In some places, it may get uh, pushed back by years because there'll be significant uncertainty about which equipment would be compatible with the US and which equipment would not be. So uh, that's basically where I stand. Uh, you've seen our downside scenario. Uh, our forecasts are at the back of this presentation, which we will make available to uh, all of you. Uh, but the bottom line is that we have substantial uh, downside to the global outlook, uh, given the spat uh, that is happening between the U.S. and the Chinese. And it's not just about trade war. It's not even just about tech war, but it's more of a divorcing uh, the two largest economies of the world. And if that were to really happen, um, 
uh, we will see uh, substantial headwinds to global growth and uh, investor confidence. Uh, I'm going to stop there. Uh, there's a lot more to cover, and I'm, we're on the 10-minute mark. So I'm going to pass this on now to Radhika Rao, our uh, economist. And uh, moving away a little bit from obsessing over U.S. and China, she will touch on the two big political economy events of uh, the last month or so, elections in India and Indonesia. Radhika, off to you. Thanks, Temur. Um, so I thought I would just quickly uh, provide uh, our view uh, post elections. Um, so India and Indonesia and, and Thailand were the few countries in the first half of the uh, year that they had elections. And I think uh, let's starting off with India. Uh, perhaps the mandate uh, was the clearest in India's case. Uh, so the ruling government has actually returned uh, for a second term. Uh, they've had a very decisive win. Uh, they've not only done better than the exit poll suggested, but also better than how they had fared in 2014. Now, uh, that which means that they have uh, got a majority in the lower house. Uh, the math for upper house is also improving. Uh, so it looks likely like by, so by end of 2020, they will also have a, a bigger hand in the upper house. So what that means is that decision making will become easier. Uh, many of the important legislation that was being held back uh, will also be much easier to pass through. Uh, so now with the elections out of the way, the next question being asked is what next? Um, uh, certainly with the government coming back with a thumping victory, expectations are very high. Um, I think the ground reality is not so. Uh, so you're going to see, uh, in fact, later tonight is the uh, GDP numbers for the first quarter of the year. Uh, they're not, it's not, numbers are not going to look too good because uh, the economy is in midst of a cyclical slowdown. Um, in the March 2019 quarter as well as June 2019, uh, growth is going to be closer to 6%. Uh, so that will be the priority for the incoming government. Uh, what do we do about reviving the economy? Uh, I think that's going to be a multi-pronged approach. Uh, part of this slowdown is transient. Essentially, because of elections, the government could not spend. Um, and you will see that government spending resume in the, in the second part of the year. Uh, you would also see... Uh, uh, the private sector, that interest that was stuck because of the bankruptcy law, if that is expedited, you would see some of the dormant capex come back onto the table. And most importantly, consumption. Consumption is the biggest driver for the economy. Uh, and there we think there will be a lot of support. Uh, firstly, there have been some measures that have already been put into place, uh, especially for the rural sector, where the, we think incomes as well as product prices uh, are going to improve, uh, in, you know, in the second half of the year. And on the urban side of the story, uh, there has been a, a liquidity squeeze. Uh, you know, uh, monetary conditions have been tighter in the first half of 2019. Uh, as soon as the elections are over now, we are seeing the currency in circulation correct itself. You're seeing liquidity become easier. You're also seeing the central bank still remaining on a accommodative bias. Now, all that is going to ease financial conditions, which in turn we think will help banks and non-banks as well as the consumers uh, get better rates. Um, so priority would be to arrest this slowdown. Uh, I think that would that would uh, um, start off with, with tonight's number. Uh, the finance minister, the uh, outgoing finance minister, Mr. Jaitley has stepped down. So we're going to have a new finance minister who's, who's, uh, who might be announced any time uh, today. Uh, the next stop is uh, budget. The budget is uh, uh, important because uh, this would be the full year budget and we have to look at where the government's priorities are. We don't expect a big change in, in their priorities in terms of being focused on inclusive growth uh, as well as uh, making sure that the, you know, the income pie grows and hence you have the rural sector as well as the urban uh, you know, bridge the gap. Uh, fourth would be reforms. Uh, reforms, we don't expect uh, any new big ticket announcements. Uh, rather, the emphasis will be to move from rollout to implementation to ensure that all the economic benefit that is required uh, percolates uh, to the populace as well as showed up, shows up in the numbers. And finally, uh, uh, markets are caught between uh, political optimism and global concerns. Uh, uh, we will uh, so domestically the strong political mandate uh, is a positive uh, for the economy, but externally the environment has been tricky. So I think the you can see that in the domestic market movement as well. Because of that, we would uh, uh, go with uh, dollar rupee on you know uh, firmer from here, um, and we will expect flows to continue subject to 
uh, what happens on the external front. I'll just quickly wrap up on Indonesia. Uh, President Jokowi has returned for a second uh, term. Uh, there are some of the opposition leaders actually uh, uh, filed the case against them, so we don't have a final say on that as yet. Court decision comes in late June. The new government takes office in October. Uh, the priority again for the government, uh, incoming government, will be primarily on infrastructure. I think that has been uh, uh, the cornerstone of the previous term as well as it's going to be for the second term as well. Uh, so the government expects the private sector also to work with them in, in improving infrastructure. Uh, and infrastructure will also to do with uh, uh, narrowing the interregional disparity. Uh, key among them would be the plan to actually move the capital away from Jakarta into one of the other provinces. This discussion has been going on for many decades, uh, but it seems to have been revived, particularly after the president as well as the planning minister have discussed this in the past. Thing. And uh, uh, domestic markets, uh, you know, rupiah is flat on the year. Uh, again, caught between what's happening domestically uh, as well as an uncertain global backdrop. I think with this, uh, I will uh, stop and I'll pass the baton on to uh, Philip, who will discuss the uh, Asian effects as well as the G3 space. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, hi. Um, regarding uh, FX, uh, we're still holding the view that uh, the dollar ball you know, not strong. Um, there's been a lot of concern about recession. Now that the 10 year has dropped not only below the Fed funds, but also below the three month e bill. Um, but we take the view that uh, the Fed at this juncture um, is going to be concerned only about global growth risk and will not subscribe to the market's fear about recession. And I think uh, if you look at the rest of the world, uh, especially uh, ECB, um, where the 10-year bond yield has not only dropped below zero, but also below um, uh, the 10-year uh, JGB yield. Um, all in all, um, other central banks uh, in the developed markets are likely uh, to ease uh, before the Fed. So uh, at this juncture, we're taking the view um, that the dollar uh, is still uh, likely to hold on um, to its uh, lingering strength at this juncture. On um, on uh, Roaming P, um, we still maintain our forecast for 7. Uh, we'll be watching the G20 summit very closely. Uh, at this juncture, uh, we've noted that over the past couple of weeks, uh, the central parity has been kept within a very tight uh, range uh, between 6.89 and 6.90. So um, there's you know, a possibility that uh, the currency is likely to be very stable um, going into the meeting uh, itself. Uh, nonetheless, uh, we are mindful that the tariffs uh, threat or the threat of uh, Trump hitting the rest of Chinese goods uh, with more tariffs um, is real. And under the circumstance, uh, I think most uh, houses, uh, including us, uh, we have uh, sort of calculated that now if China wants to offset the impact of all um, all the tariffs, um, the risk of dollar China moving about seven towards eight uh, cannot be discounted. So under the circumstance, uh, uh, we would probably need to revise some most of our dollar Asian uh, forecast. But at this juncture, uh, we're still adopting a wait and see mode. Um, noted that most central banks are also taking the view that uh, if you know by some miracle that we get a tall in the trade tensions. Um, at the G20, um, that uh, there could be, you know, uh, a sort of relief and uh, businesses uh, could um, start uh, um, hold, uh, stop hold, holding back their investment plans. Okay, um, uh, now just to address some of the questions uh, that we have. Um, what the mo uh, first one is probably the, uh, what has been on everyone's mind. Why is Singapore put on the currency monitor list? Well, um, you know, <clears throat> it was quite a surprise for most of us, uh, given that you know, uh, US has a trade surplus with Singapore, and uh, on my uh, on my part, I've been sort of explaining that um, it is impossible to hold a strong sing dollar policy with a current account deficit. So the current account surplus is consistent, I think, uh, with our exchange rate regime, and um, Singapore has moved from being a manufacturing hub into a global financial center. 
uh, and we have also moved to you know and we have so also moved um, from attracting uh, FDIs to you know becoming investors uh, in the region as well so um, so but we don't see uh, any immediate impact and uh, at this juncture I would say that the global trade concerns is a bigger worry for the nominal dollar sing exchange rate which we have in our forecast still moving towards 140 by the third quarter of this year. Yeah, Philip, so there are a few other questions on FX. We'll come back to that in the Q&A session. So let's just go straight to Eugene now. Yeah, so, so the, the big few questions I've been getting is uh, why, why are you so low? And then uh, we have dropped about more than 100 basis points for the 10-year US over the past uh, two, three quarters. So I think we have to reassess our outlook. And uh, what we are seeing is that downside risks are bound. So aside from the US-China tensions ratcheting up quite a few notches over the past few weeks, we also have to deal with the global cycle still slowing down. So initially, there, there were some better PMIs out of China as well as the Eurozone, but what we saw is that this nascent uh, recovery seems to have petered out. So in which case, if you look at the chart there, the grey line, which captures the 10-year yields across the developed world, uh, it is it's already pushing new lows, right? So against this backdrop where global growth is slowing, it is very, very difficult for, for the U.S. to, to stay strong alone. Right? So therefore, uh, uh, with U.S. yields gets dragged down, uh, we are looking at technical downside as much as 2%. So this has got nothing to do with U.S. fundamentals, which are holding up very well. But if German boon yields are pushing record lows, uh, it is very difficult for the U.S. to escape this gravity. Now, as Philip mentioned, uh, U.S. yields are very low, the inversion is there, recession risks are elevated. If you use a 3-month tenure, uh, it is pointing to around 30-35% chance of recession over the next 12 months. Uh, it is something to keep in mind, uh, even as we monitor the political developments, the trade developments as well as the cycles. So recession risks are elevated and probably the most elevated we have seen over the past decade. Right, moving on to uh, Singapore, right? So we've got questions on why are Singapore interest rates going up despite uh, declines in, in the three-month LIBOR. So the short answer is that sing liquidity is tight. Uh, there's been a, a lot of bond issuances and not that much maturity. Uh, the authorities appear to be withdrawing a fair amount of liquidity. And so the net-net effect considering that the SING dollar is also weak, is that SAW and CYBOR has come under some upward pressure despite the easing off in LIBOR over the past few months. Uh, will this be sustained? Well, under normal conditions, if the Fed holds steady, uh, then there should not be much more upside to SING rates. However, if there were a shock that hits the global sentiment in a very big way, you could see a temporary spike in CYBOR and SAW following which uh, there could be a settling down into a more normal range, which is where we are now. Clearly, if the Fed cuts, then uh, Cyborg and Saw will face downside risk. The chart on the right actually shows you the funding uh, from the financial institutions in Singapore. Uh, you will see that savings deposits have actually gone sideways and that more of the funding goes. Yeah, Eugene, uh, there's something wrong with the chart. So to those who can't see it, I guess we need to point out that the gray line is savings deposit and the red line on the right-hand side is a fixed deposit rate. Yes, yeah, so, so what you see is that over the past uh, year plus or so, uh, the, the funding is true, uh, the fixed deposit rates, which are more expensive to maintain. So uh, this is another sign of uh, tighter liquidity, more competition for funds over the past few months that's been keeping Cyborg and so uh, a little bit elevated. Uh, with that, I think I've tackled most of the rates questions. So maybe Joanne will talk more about equities. All right, thanks, uh, Eugene. Uh, so this is the first time we're actually having a discussion on equities in our uh, uh, write-up, but we think that the asset class has shown very interesting characteristics, to say the least, in the last few months. So Joanne, it's all yours now. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, I've got a Asia-X Japan uh, valuation chart for you. And um, the chart shows that actually for Asia X Japan valuation is actually on the high side. 
So even before the uh, trade uh, war uh, threat sort, sort of uh, resurface in May, valuations uh, is our, our really our main concern. All right. And so what it suggests is that um, there's limited upside risk because valuations are already quite high. And there's also very little room for cushion uh, if trade war resurface and then uh, downside risk to earnings. All right. And um, if you look at the same chart again, um, the correction, the, the lower valuations we have earlier in the year um, is no more there. And therefore, you know, we think that's the upside for equity should be quite limited. Uh, again, from the same chart, um, the, but at this time, we think that the correction this time round uh, um, should be shorter and short, shallower compared to last year. Uh, mainly, if you look at uh, what's happening between last year and this year, um, we have got a Fed, uh, which is more dovish than last year when everyone was talking about rate hikes last year at this time, but now this uh, rate cuts, you know. And uh, during last year, when a lot of the economy numbers was rolling over, right now at least, you know, all the numbers like exports numbers, PMI numbers are actually on the very low side and there are very little expectations on uh, growth going forward. Right, so this time round, uh, we think that um, compared to last year when the correction is about 22% and it's for six months, uh, this time round should be uh, shorter and shallower. All right, so how do we position in Asian markets at this time? We think it should still be quite defensive, uh, mainly downside risk on growth is there. And if, let's say, we really have a full-blown trade war, uh, there's already, there's definitely going to be a lot more downside risk to uh, forecast. Um, the chart shows the, uh, the Asian markets that we sort of covered, we cover, and uh, is um, based on earnings growth on the y-axis and valuations on the x-axis. And um, if you compare this chart, we think that the most, um, the two main quadrants on the top left quadrant, those are the ones which where earnings growth are relatively higher and valuations uh, are relatively lower uh, than the region. And these are the markets that we like, including China and Singapore. And on the bottom right color, uh, quadrant, yeah, those are the markets probably you uh, would like to ignore, uh, lower growth and also uh, more expensive valuations. But we cannot ignore uh, some of the structural and the domestic demand markets uh, where although valuations are high, but growth uh, seems to be quite resilient, especially in ASEAN and also India. Uh, so some of them, we have to look at it uh, from some of the structural uh, drivers and demog demographics drivers uh, that are present. Among these two markets, uh, we like Indonesia and we also like Philippines. Um, the cyclical markets, Taiwan and Korea, uh, those are very ex uh, exports-oriented and tech-oriented and uh, downside risk uh, definitely is a lot higher compared to the rest of the Asian markets. So these are uh, some of our uh, underweight markets, Korea, Taiwan, and Malaysia for now, yeah, we think that um, there are still downside risk to growth. And uh, these are also our underweight markets. Uh, thank you, Joanne. Uh, although uh, during the Q&A section, we have to go through some uh, growth and FX and rates related questions. There is one equity, since we have you here, might as well uh, squeeze that in. So the question is, uh, do you think Singapore equity has more downside than Asia PAC equity? Uh, and uh, would you recommend shifting from SGP only equity to a broader Asia PAC equity exposure? Um, I think at this um, in this environment uh, where you have got downside risk almost to um, all markets and Asia Asia asset classes, um, it, it, we think that you should still be quite defensive and Singapore generally is still considered quite a defensive market. I mean, if you look at Singapore exports, I mean, it's still exports oriented, but compared to Taiwan and Korea, less tech. And if you look at Singapore versus the ASEAN markets, you know, ASEAN generally, you know, the forex volatility is quite high and Singapore uh, currency basket is there and uh, generally quite easily understood and quite stable. So from that perspective, we think that Singapore can still give you some kind of defensiveness uh, compared to the rest of the region. And of course, Singapore uh, valuations uh, can still, uh, still one of the cheaper markets in Asia. And Singapore has got one of the highest yields in, uh, in the region. It has got about 4% uh, dividend yield. So in terms of um, return protection, yeah, Singapore can give you some kind of that. So I would still recommend uh, having um, more weights in Singapore. Uh, 
And the risk of running a, into an Asia X Japan funds is that uh, you will be uh, quite uh, quite uh, you'll be having quite a lot of uh, some of the bigger markets like Taiwan and Korea. And these are the markets we think you should avoid at this moment. Very good. Thank you very much, Joanne. Um, one final thing, and this is a bit of an advertisement for a large project that we have initiated. So what we're trying to do is looking at look at a wide range of asset classes and a series of high frequency indicators and aggregate those uh, sentiments and those prices into one composite measure. So this is what you have here. It's a global macro risk dashboard. We published the first one yesterday and we plan to carry out regular updates of this. Um, and so what you're seeing right now is basically a distillation of all the work that goes into the project, the one composite risk score. And this is showing that it's not exactly flashing red lights yet, but we're sort of heading in that direction. And when you break it down into various asset classes, this is what it shows you. That global growth momentum right now is neither great nor too bad. Uh, the risk is, of course, it slows further around the trade war uncertainties, but the latest numbers don't suggest that things have started falling off a cliff just yet. Equity markets are perhaps the most sanguine asset classes that we have seen out there right now, uh, particularly when you look at uh, the U.S. market uh, and also the lack of very sizable sell-offs since uh, the beginning of last uh, this uh, beginning of May, when trade war escalated substantially. Uh, that sort of tells us that the equity markets are expecting the trade wars to somehow or the other work out, and also don't expect growth to fall off in a substantial manner. So, which is why it's sort of in the green-yellow range that we look at. But if you see the contrasting features in the developed market, DM, fixed income, or even emerging market, fixed income market, uh, the way the rates have rallied clearly tells you that expectations in that set of the asset class is very, very bearish. Emerging market exchange rates in Asia, they may not have shown so much nervousness, but we've certainly seen the Argentinas and the Turkeys of the world seeing substantial pressure uh, so far this year. And since the RMB started to display considerable volatility about three weeks ago, we're beginning to see that spill, pressure spill over into rest of Asian FX as well. And developer market FX is a bit of a tale of two worlds, as Philip has said earlier, that uh, the U.S. may be losing uh, reasons to remain bullish, but then the rest of the developed markets are not doing themselves any favor by sort of narrowing the relative uh, gap, uh, performance gap. Uh, so you, Europe is looking weaker by the day, so hence the relative weakness in the U.S. is uh, not that profoundly negative for the US dollar. Uh, developed market credit are right now still very well behaved. In fact, the uh, Fed, I believe it was the New York Fed, uh, which came out with a paper recently sh addressing this question that there's a huge amount of debt in, uh, uh, on the credit side in the US, uh, but at the same time, the various metrics that relate to debt sustainability look fairly good. Uh, but we remain sort of wary of that area because the accumulation in uh, developed market uh, credit over the uh, last 10 years or so is substantial. Emerging market credit, again, not particularly bad right now, but uh, there's considerable worry about dollar tightness, liquidity tightness, and growth slowdown, another area that we're looking at keeping an eye on. And finally, in global debt, that's more of a stock variable than a flow variable. We're basically looking at very substantial pickup in corporate and public sector debt over the last decade, uh, especially in the US, but also in China. With that in mind, uh, we're going to go to the various questions that we have. So some of the questions have already been addressed, particularly Joanne just talked about the Singapore equity question, uh, and Philip had talked about the Singh issue, but there are things that we need to get to Philip but in a minute. First, uh, what will happen on June 17, a leading question. June 17 is the day we're expecting the U.S. Uh, to uh, make or break the 25% uh, tariff decision. I have to tell you, we're two and a half weeks away from that point. There is really nothing in the pipeline that will lead to a breakthrough. It's not like the Americans or the Chinese are meeting every day and that some deal could get trashed out. Basically, everybody is focused on the late June G20 meeting when Premier Xi Jinping and President Trump are supposed to meet. Um, so I, I maybe it will be a diluted effort. On June 17, some products will see an escalation of tariff and they'll still be hearing about uh, smartphones and uh, displays and TVs. Maybe those prices don't go up immediately or those tariffs don't go up immediately. But I really don't see any uh, de-escalation of the trade war on the 17th of June. Uh, how does uh, US-China trade war impact Singapore since we have a good relationship with both countries? I think countries like Singapore, and not just Singapore, even Singapore's neighboring countries like China, uh, uh, like uh, Indonesia or Malaysia, it is not possible for these countries to pick a side. These are open economies with significant trade, uh, political, 
economic and military linkage to the U.S. and to the Chinese. Uh, so I think that leaders of these countries will refuse to be put in a position a la the Lion King, that if you're not with me, you're against me. I don't think uh, Asian countries uh, can afford to pick a side. And therefore, I think that uh, the challenge would be for the Chinese and the Americans to understand that these trade-oriented open economies of Southeast Asia, they, it is imperative for them to have good relationship with the U.S. and the Chinese, and they should not be put in a position to pick a side. Um, uh, I think I will now move to uh, Philip because uh, maybe there's a little more, Philip, because it's a question on the uh, thing. It ended with the how's the USD, SGD, and USD Asian. How will they be affected uh, if trade wars continue to uh, uh, intensify? So beyond the issue of your forecast revision, is there anything else you want to add? Um, I think, <coughs> sorry, uh, uh, for us, uh, if the tariff comes in uh, on China, then uh, we would have to, you know, lift the dollar thing and the uh, dollar China and you know most of the Asian currencies as well. Um, but can I, I think I would like to address one of the question, the last one. Um, today we send out uh, some revisions in our FX forecast. I think. Uh, Thank you for reading. <laughs> I have taken note, you know, that we have revised down our Australian dollar. Um, this is a follow up to last month's, I think, live stream, uh, where the question was asked, you know, whether we think that the RBA would cut rates. So, um, our, I think our comment back then was that uh, the uh, the ingredients are there. Uh, the RBA statement uh, that came out, uh, they are forecasting growth to probably drop below two percent, and that was done. Uh, before the uh, renewed uh, tariff tensions. Uh, but more importantly, I think the one reason that the RBA has been holding back has been the job markets and unemployment rate has shot back above 5%. So the door is open for them to ease and the 10-year bond yield has dropped below the uh, RBA cash rate. So um, now the only question is, will the RBA signal uh, more cuts you know, uh, right after uh, the next meeting um, in June. Um, so we think that the possibility um, for another cut uh, should not be discounted. So we'll be watching very closely. Um, with regards to the uh, forecast, we have already broken below uh, the 70 handle. So if you look at um, the past cycles, um, so we are essentially um, looking at all the lows you know, in the previous uh, down cycle, so uh, so we think that it's reasonable for uh, the Aussie dollar to consider dropping below the sixty five handle as well. But that is not your uh, baseline forecast, uh, Philip. Uh, it is. Oh, sorry, yes. So you're basically saying that it goes towards sixty four in the third quarter of this year, and then it starts appreciating and heads past seventy in three quarters time. Uh, yes, that's assuming that. Uh, we avoid a recession. So right now, most of our forecast is premised uh, on our GDP growth as well, uh, which we expect some stabilization, maybe some second half recovery. So um, this is evident in our Singapore growth forecast, uh, which uh, sees uh, the GDP growth moving back above the midpoint of the new official forecast. So right now, the uh, latest growth number is below the official forecast. Right. Um, okay. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Philip. Uh, Eugene, a couple of uh, rates question. Uh, what is the outlook for a sing dollar cyber rate? You don't have to add more to what you had said earlier unless you want to. And then there's this uh, question on rates inversion in the U.S. Treasury is now more pronounced. Does DBS continue to hold a view? You probably touched on this. Uh, again, if you want to add more on that, those two issues. Yeah. I think maybe I'll just add more more color, right? So within the AAA space, uh, Singapore interest rates are incredibly high, right? In, in nominal terms as well as in the real terms, adjusting for inflation. So so by some measures, Singapore rates are uh, cheap, right? So so the the, the risk is that uh, if the trade negotiations go all right, then the there's possibility for Asia FX weakness spilling over to Sing weakness, which could cause a squeeze higher in the cyber and saw from already elevated levels. However, should that play out, then we should think that it will be reasonable for the Fed to react more dovishly and eventually 
you will see lower as I went so. Uh, yeah, so I think that's all I have to say for those two. You know, it's interesting, in the context of Singapore, and what I'm about to say is somewhat of a riff of what uh, Joanne was saying earlier, which is that Singapore is no longer basically a one-trick electronics pony. And the country has a large export sector around services and biomedical, uh, which, in my view, make it a little more resilient than it was in the past with respect to significant fluctuations in the global trade cycle. Uh, we don't see that sort of diversification happen in the Koreas and Taiwans, where again, the manufacturing exports remain the biggest source of data for the growth outlook. In my view, electronics is still very important for Singapore, but when you look at the behavior of non-oil domestic exports uh, related to the rest of the region, it doesn't seem to be as pronounced, and it does seem, in my view, that there is a greater degree of shock absorbency in the economy given its uh, service sector orientation uh, that is becoming more and more prevalent and non-electronics manufacturing where Singapore is also playing a, a bigger and bigger role. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, the point that Joanne was making that there is not a whole lot of point to diversify away from Singapore into the areas that are actually even higher beta to the trade war risk, in my view, makes uh, eminent sense. Uh, one final point, we're beginning to sort of run out of time, I think we have over four minutes left, is, uh, and that's something that, you know, Radhika had to sort of go over very, very fast because she was running out of time but on the issue of Indonesia, which is that the economic fundamentals have not been rosy, but at the same time, they have shown tremendous lack of variation over the last five, six years. In a world that is becoming more and more uncertain, in my view, that lack of variation will actually carry premium going forward. Even in a dire trade environment, Indonesia can grow by 5%. You cannot say that about most economies in the world these days, at least most economies with decent size. And therefore, in my view, uh, the rupiah facing some pressure, the Indonesia fixed income facing some pressure will immediately bring back uh, real money investors and sovereign wealth funds who like Indonesia's yield, who like Indonesia's uh, domestic demand story, and who are assured by one more peaceful transform, transfer of power uh, that is evident. I mean, we saw a little bit of a hiccup around some protests, but these are you know, uh, rather, rather marginal given the size of Indonesia and the scale and uh, stakes that were involved in the election. Um, Radhika, do you want to add anything more on Indonesia in terms of our growth outlook or where do you see the Jokowi government's uh, second term uh, priorities would be? Sure. So growth has uh, uh, stabilized in the first quarter of the year. Uh, growth disappointed a bit. Again, similar to India, uh, I think there was a uh, uh, reduction. Government spending was was on a slow lane. Uh, also, if you recall last year, uh, because of the current account uh, deterioration, uh, the government had actually put, uh, slowed down on the import intensive uh, infrastructure imports. So because of that, uh, since the second half of last year, as well as early this year, government spending has actually been part. Back. Uh, so I think that will come back in the second half of the year. Uh, so you would see growth in the, uh, the 5 to 5.3% 5 kind of handle. So pretty much, uh, uh, you know, stable uh, if you were to compare the past two, three years. Uh, and consumption being the front and center uh, of the economy. So I think that will continue to grow. Uh, for the government, I, I think it is going to be, again, um, uh, infrastructure, which is, which is, I think, for the... Uh, in the development cycle that the economy is in, uh, the kind of structure that Indonesia has, where it has a lot of um, islands and which are, uh, and you know, Java Island being the most uh, developed uh, in the sort. Uh, so the government's agenda in the first term as well as the second term is to improve connectivity. Uh, I think there are a lot of plans in the pipeline to set up aero strips uh, to make it easy for smaller flights to be able to go back and forth. Uh, they, they are toying with about a 400 billion worth uh, infrastructure development uh, uh, you know, project, which will involve 40% government, 20% uh, state-owned, and uh, the rest uh, to do with the private sector players. So they, uh, while their fiscal balance is a deficit is pretty much in shape, but they do require the private sector uh, as well as the state-owned enterprises to come in and lend a hand. So growth uh, to us looks uh, stable uh, in the 5 to 5.3% kind of time. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Radhika. Uh, Joanne, 30-second answer on Indonesia. You were bullish Indonesia at the beginning of the year, which was a good trade for a few months, and then it became a bad trade. You remain long 
Yeah, we're still overweight in Indonesia. We think that after post-elections, um, the government can really uh, focus on uh, the growth prospects. And if you look at the way that BI has been handling the, um, the crisis uh, last year, you now we have got confidence that yeah, they will be able to uh, push through uh, quite a lot of policies yeah, that will, uh, that will uh, help uh, with rupiah stability. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, we have unfortunately run out of time. Uh, this was a rather uh, quick tour de force through a large number of asset classes, but we're trying to keep the call short uh, so that, you know, we try to sort of you know, not trade off uh, quality for quantity. Uh, thanks very much for listening in. Uh, we'll be back again at the end of June. And these days, not a dull moment in the macro universe. So I'm sure we'll have a lot more bases to cover then. Uh, we wish you all a very restful weekend. And thanks for listening in. Goodbye.